This is the brand new Samyang 35 to 150mm f2 to 2.8 zoom lens. Now, if that focal range sounds familiar to you, then it's probably because Tamron first pioneered this lens design a few years ago and it was a huge hit. Now, there's two options to choose from, so the question is, which one is the best? Well, starting with the build quality, Samyang really haven't taken any chances with this new lens, and at first glance, it's almost identical to the Tamron, so I guess it's just a case of if it ain't broke, don't fix it. Not only are these lenses the same size, but there's only around a 50 gram weight difference difference too. They have the same 82mm filter thread, the zooms rotate in the same direction and also they feature a lock switch that keeps them fixed at the 35mm end to help prevent lens creep whilst it's not in use. Oh wait, there's more! Both lenses have a weather seal construction complete with rubber gasket around the lens mount. The switch placement on the lens barrel is pretty much identical too. They both have a manual MF to AF switch and customizable AF lock buttons, albeit the Tamron has a third button at the 6 o'clock position, whilst the Samyang only has two buttons placed at 12 and three o'clock. They both have three custom modes which can be toggled between using this switch, giving you a wealth of ways to customize how the buttons and dials function on the lens. Now one slight distinction here is that to configure these custom modes with the Tamron lens all you need is a standard USB-C cable which connects via this port near the lens mount. With the Samyang lens on the other hand you will be required to purchase a Samyang lens dock in addition which to be fair is only an additional 50 bucks but still I personally prefer the USB option as it seems way more convenient. Fresh out of the box the manual dial on the Samyang has very little in the way of resistance compared to the Tamron, though I should mention that this is a pre-production model that I'm testing, so this may change when it finally hits store shelves. That said, it wasn't at all unpleasant to use, and although it does use a focus by wire system, it's very responsive and has a nice linear feel to it. The Tamron offers more resistance in the dial and also uses a fly-by wire system, and although it felt linear too, I did notice that it did become slightly less consistent when making smaller rotations. At this point, it is worth mentioning that the the focus ring control is one of the things you can fine tune on these lenses, so if you don't like how it operates out of the box, simply plug it into your computer and you can change it. In any case, neither lens displays any major signs of focus breathing, which is certainly good news for videographers. So for once in my life, I have absolutely nothing to complain about at this stage, so both of these lenses deserve a point for build quality and handling. But I'm sure by this point, you're all dying to know how much is this new Samyang lens going to cost? Well, as we all know, the Tamron is currently priced at around $1,899 in the US and $1,799 £799 here in the UK. In comparison, at launch, this Samyang is going to retail at just $1,315 or £1,319, which means it's a whopping $584 cheaper than its rival. So needless to say, the Samyang gets the point for price here, but does that mean that in order to keep the cost down, Samyang have had to cut a bunch of corners when it comes to performance and image quality? Well, starting with the autofocus, in good lighting conditions, both lenses are rapid to focus with no real signs of hunting. In low light conditions, although both lenses took a little while longer to lock on, they still managed to find their target in the end and neither of them showed any significant signs of hunting. And to be fair, these lenses really aren't designed to operate in such low light conditions, so the fact that they both performed well in this test is really just a testament to their design. When shooting wide open in high speed continuous mode at the 35mm end of the zooms, the majority of the shots I took with these two lenses were sharp and in focus, with both lenses only dropping focus towards the end of the walk as George got really close to the camera. At the one 50 end, both lenses put in a near faultless performance with nearly all of the shots being perfectly focused. So with both lenses putting in an even performance in this round, I think it's points all round for Photo AF. Switching over to video mode now, and when shooting at the 35mm end of the zoom, neither lens had any issue tracking George as he walked towards the camera. Repeating the test, but this time at a faster pace, gave me the same exact results. At the 150 end of the zoom, again, both lenses kept locked on to George without any issues, both when walking at a regular pace, and when repeating the test but at a faster pace. As for AF noise, both of these lenses are generally pretty quiet, though the built-in microphone on my Sony a7 Mark IV was able to pick up a very slight grinding noise on the Samyang footage, and also on the Tamron footage, but albeit a little bit quieter. When shooting in a real-world scenario, both lenses were more than capable of capturing amazing-looking video footage. Their heavier weight does mean that you're going to need a pretty beefy gimbal setup if you're thinking about using these for tracking shots, and obviously the lenses do rack out as you zoom, so that's potentially going to give you some issues when it comes to balancing. But that said, both options are able to focus quickly and accurately, and they also worked well whilst using my Sony a7 Mark IV's IAF and face detection features, so I really don't have anything to complain about in terms of their performance. So with another pretty perfect round 
for these lenses, it's more points across the board. In our bokeh balls test, the results really couldn't be much closer, to be honest, with both lenses creating nice round orbs across the majority of the frame, only being slightly clipped at the extreme edges. Both sets of orbs are quite textured, though the Samyang results are slightly less so, and both sets of orbs also have a slight haloing effect. Moving on to general bokeh quality, and to my eyes, these results are practically identical, with both lenses offering a nice, soft, defocused area when shooting wide open at f2.8. So with the test results being just way too close to call an overall winner, I think it's points all round. In our lens flare test, both lenses display quite heavy artifacting and ghosting when shooting into bright direct light at the 35mm end of the zoom, though if this type of thing really bothers you, both lenses do come included with lens hoods, so that should help shade the front element in harsh lighting conditions. On our longitudinal chromatic aberration test, the Samyang's results are incredibly clean, with next to no fringing seen on the chart. The Tamron, on the other hand, does display a yellowish kind of lime green tint above the area of sharp focus, and a mild purple fringe at the bottom. You may also notice that the Tamron chart is much warmer in general than the Samyang chart, but more on that in a moment. At the 35mm end, both lenses have a touch of barrel distortion, and in terms of centre sharpness, the results are practically neck and neck, and I really couldn't confidently pick out a winner. Both lenses do suffer from blue and a kind of yellowish fringing, though the Samyang results are more towards the blue end, whilst the Tamron chart shows more of a yellow tint. At the corners, it's close again, though the Tamron is sharper. At the 150mm end of the zoom, both lenses now display a touch of pink cushion distortion. If I was really splitting hairs, then the Samyang is very marginally sharper, but not enough to be that much of a big deal. Both lenses still display the same blue and yellow fringing issues, and at the corners, the Tamron is arguably slightly sharper. At the minimum focusing distance, the Tamron is able to focus slightly closer than the Samyang at the 35mm end. At the centre, the results are just too close to call a decisive winner once again. At the 150mm end, it's once again neck and neck. Anyway, pixel peeping aside, I've got to admit, I still had lots of fun shooting with these lenses out in the real world. Sure, they are a little on the heavy side for me, as I'm personally used to shooting with smaller primes, but the fact that you can go from a wide 35mm all the way to a 150mm telephoto all in one lens just makes it such a versatile lens to work with, and it's no wonder that Samyang wants to get in on a piece of the action. As I mentioned just a moment ago, I did notice a slight colour difference between these two lenses. The Tamron definitely produces images with a slightly warmer tint, whilst the Samyang is more neutral, or perhaps even on the colder side, depending on how you look at it. Obviously, this is a pretty quick thing to fix using the temperature slider in Lightroom or Photoshop. However, I did feel like it was worth mentioning if this is something that bothers you. Now, I should also mention that although these zooms state that they have a maximum aperture of f2 to f2.8, the f2 aperture is only achievable when shooting at 35 millimeters or up to 45 millimeters. Past that point at 50 millimeters, it'll close down to f2.2, then down to f2.5 at around the 65 millimeter mark, and finally down to f2.8 at around 80 millimeters, where it stays until 150 millimeters. Now, this is the case for both of these lenses, so if you did have dreams of being able to shoot at f2 for the majority of the zoom range, well, then think again. But that said, being able to shoot at f2 at 35 millimeters means that you are getting a full stop of light more than you would do at f2.8, so I really shouldn't grumble. Anyway, technical stuff aside, you can clearly see that both of these lenses are capable of producing awesome results, which is only good news for us as Sony shooters, but also kind of bad news for me because it makes it extremely tough to pick a winner. Although the lens chart results were very closely matched in terms of sharpness and everything else, for me personally, the Samyang just edges it in this round because it creates less longitudinal chromatic aberration. That said, I still think the Tamron deserves at least half a point in this round because it's still a fantastic lens. But at the end of scoring, the Samyang picks up the win in this head-to-head -head test because not only is it able to stand up to the Tamron in pretty much all areas of testing, but it also does so whilst being $600 cheaper, which is pretty impressive. Personally, I'm really interested to see how Tamron will respond to this new competition. Will we see a price reduction on this current model, or perhaps Tamron will now be working hard to create a Mark II version to better this new competitor? But what do you think? Be sure to let me know your thoughts in the comments below. Give the video a thumbs up as always if you've enjoyed it, and I will see you in the next video. Shake it, baby.